faith, of course, which is the gospel, which is the gospel of truth. The gospel which we receive from divine revelation, from the word incarnate, made flesh, himself the word of God, Jesus Christ, both God and man, Emmanuel, God with us. The gospel, of course, is the summation of all his teaching. And as well, the faith contains all of that which he imparted himself in person, if not necessarily to the evangelists and the authors of the gospels, but to the apostles and to those first disciples. And what our Lord imparted to them, of course, was the truth, the truth concerning God, the truth concerning man, the truth concerning creation, the truth concerning our need of redemption, our need of wholeness, how our wholeness and perfection will only be achieved with and in and through God. Now this, of course, is what we understand to be the truth of the Gospel, and this is what St Bonaventure himself applied to himself and to those he taught. And we in turn, of course, are bid to do likewise. To quote from a famous movie, or to quote a line from a famous movie, and yes, I've forgotten the name of the movie, but the quote is still pertinent, truth, you can't handle the truth. And indeed, my brothers and sisters, that is largely the reaction of many to the gospel. They can't handle the plain truth. Indeed, my brothers and sisters, we are all quite bad at dealing with the truth. If the truth be known, most of us seek to, in some ways, manipulate or avoid the truth. Indeed, many in today's contemporary society have gotten to such a stage of denying the truth that they have suggested there is no such thing as truth, that there is no such thing as objective truth, that there is no such thing as uh, truth other than that which is perceived or subjectively appreciated or understood and interpreted for and by every individual themselves. That is the contemporary zeitgeist. That is what we are largely dealing with at the moment. None of us surely can be uh, ignorant uh, to the present crisis uh, in society, particularly in society in the West, which concerns this question of truth. We ourselves keep hearing about, do we not, fake news and fake facts. And at the same time, we uh, understand uh, that so-called progressive ideologies rely on the contemporary and modern interpretation of truth as being relativistic or even synchristic, but there being no absolute objective truth. And without the, con without the ideological concepts abounding at the moment, even we ourselves as individuals are not very good at dealing with the truth. Often we prefer uh, not to deal with the truth. Even, even perhaps uh, when we are uh, trying to be good, sometimes we avoid the truth. Because the truth is that truth itself, objective truth, doesn't appear very loving sometimes. And often we use that as an excuse to avoid it. So that we, all of us, have employed uh, a mechanism called white lies. Sometimes we will avoid telling somebody the absolute truth and we will give them a version of the truth in order, we think, to protect their sensibilities. And yet, as uh, surely we all know too from experience, nine out of ten times, those little white lies become exposed. And often the result is tantamount to the same as if uh, we had just told the truth in the first place. Sometimes even worse. You see, at least when we tell the truth, the plain truth, in the first instance, it can either be accepted or rejected. And 
generally when people find out that they have not been told the whole truth, often they uh, react very negatively. How often have we heard or have we said, well, why didn't you just say that in the first place? Why didn't you just tell me that? And the trouble is, that secondary negative reaction is often far worse than the one we were expecting or we thought there might be if we had told the truth in the first place. Part of the reason we avoid telling the truth is to avoid mistrust. And yet, of course, that is the actual result whenever the truth comes out, that trust becomes broken. And that first instinct we thought of protecting someone and we thought we were motivated by love in that, of course, becomes false and exposed as a lie. There are all sorts of ways in, and devices through which we all avoid the truth or we manipulate the truth. Often, sometimes, I would suggest it's better to avoid, uh, omit the truth if you can't handle the truth and if you don't think somebody else can handle the truth. Of course, in many ways that's not any better. The sin of omission is still a sin, but even so. The point, my brothers and sisters, is that we none of us are very good at handling the truth. We can't handle the truth. That, my brothers and sisters, is itself what we sometimes call a truism. The truth is, we cannot handle the truth. We cannot handle the fact that we are but creatures, that we were created. We can't handle the fact that we are sinners. We can't handle the fact that we are selfish. We can't handle the fact that of our own effort and merit we are not worthy of heaven. We can't handle the fact that we need to repent. We can't handle the fact that we need forgiveness or absolution. We can't handle the fact that there is a higher morality than our own. We can't handle the fact that there is such a thing as objective truth. We cannot handle the truth. And yet the truth desires us. The truth desires and demands and requires a relationship with us that will enable us to handle the truth that will enable us to handle the fact that we are sinners, that will help us to handle and deal with the fact that we, of our own effort and merit, are not worthy of heaven, that will help us uh, deal with and appreciate the fact that we don't know everything, we don't know all there is to know, that will help us appreciate that, in fact, we do need to live according to a higher moral value system than we might otherwise impose for our selfish selves. And that truth, of course, is the objective truth of the Gospel itself. Sadly and regrettably, contrary to the example of people like St Bonaventure in the history of the Church, there are many in positions of teaching and authority today who themselves can't handle the truth and who some of them believe nobody can handle the truth. And so they obfuscate and manipulate the truth, seemingly to make the truth easier, more accessible, more palatable, more appreciable, easier to understand and to deal with. But in so doing, they fall foul of that admonition that our Lord himself gave us in the Gospel today. 
whoever then sets aside one of these commandments, though it were the least, meaning though it seems or might appear to be less important, and teaches others to do like, will be of least account in the kingdom of heaven. Notice here that the truth of the gospel is not saying that such a person is necessarily condemned to an eternity without the knowledge of the presence of God, but rather that they are made the least in the kingdom of heaven. So many pastors and leaders of the church today will become least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't think that my saying that suggests that I think I will be one of the greatest. It doesn't at all. I, myself, am simply trying to do what the gospel requires and what the apostles exhort to us. Trying to abide as other faithful orthodox bishops throughout the world and pastors and teachers to abide by the instruction of St Paul. Preach the word dwelling upon it continually, welcome or unwelcome. Bring home wrongdoing, comfort the waverer, rebuke the sinner with all the patience of a teacher. For a time is coming when people will turn a deaf ear to the truth, bestowing their attention on fables instead. This is why, my brothers and sisters, I speak about and warn about the contemporary ideologies and the general zeitgeist of the contemporary culture in which we live in, which are at such variance to the received truth of the gospel and of the faith. Because they are basically untruths. They are basically lies. Some of them, we might say, are little white lies, perhaps. But often they obfuscate the truth. They cloud the truth. They don't make the truth clear and plain. White lies deliberately kind of put a veneer over it. And the same is true of contemporary theology, much contemporary theology. And the problem with all of that is that it clouds and obfuscates the truth about true love. Because true love is of itself, by its very nature, sacrificial. Of its very nature may indeed be experienced through pain and suffering, even tortuously. True love is not the nicey-nicey, fluffy-wuffy love that most people think of and talk about. That fluffy-wuffy love, as nice as it sounds and as appealing as it sounds and as justified as sometimes it appears, is in fact a falsehood. It is in fact a lie. At best, a white lie. But otherwise, it obfuscates and clouds and creates delusion. It is a delusion. It is an illusion. However, true love, which as I say, by its very nature is sacrificial, may and often does involve pain and suffering. The true love, of course, of which I speak is that made manifest by God in Christ upon the cross, which in a very real, tangible and physical way was about pain and suffering, but actually reflects perhaps the emotional pain and suffering of God in 
nothing else. An analogy for us of that kind of true love that involves pain and suffering is the pain and suffering of a parent for their child, for their errant child, for that awkward child, for that difficult child, for that child that just simply won't do what they're supposed to do or simply won't help themselves. For that child who is always doing wrong. The pain and suffering of a parent for that child involves often dealing with uncomfortable truths. It's this, for this reason that our Lord himself told us, taught us, when we pray, Our Father, Our Father, which art in heaven. Pater Noster, qui es in chains. Making the point. And so often our Lord uses the imagery of parenthood for God in his parables. Think of that wonderful parable of the prodigal son. The father in the parable is God, waiting always to love us, waiting always to love his errant children. Some might even say, who spoiled his child? Like God spoils us by giving us free will, by allowing us the opportunity to choose for ourselves. And in our choices, we offer him pain and suffering, just as our errant children offer us pain and suffering, just as the prodigal son only offered pain and suffering to the ever-loving father. That is true love. That is sacrificial love. That is love that embodies within it pain and suffering. Often when we choose to tell a white lie or obfuscate the truth is because we want to prevent pain and suffering. And as I said, that when the truth comes out, it happens anyway. Thus, wouldn't it be more loving and more correct, more true, to just say the truth in the first place? And yes, saying the truth might involve pain and suffering, but it's the truth. And because it's the truth, People will have to respond and deal with it. They will have to handle it. And with the truth of the gospel, as I've already illustrated concerning the nature of ourselves and of creation and of God and of our need for redemption, that which is all encompassed in the gospel, despite the pain and suffering that the Blessed Trinity endure in love for us because of giving us free will, yet, yet they provide every assistance, every means of grace possible to help us, to console us, to enable us to deal with and handle the truth. the solace and the comfort and the grace that is afforded us in the sacraments of the church, particularly of baptism for salvation and of penance and Eucharist for restoration and for healing and for wholeness and for experiencing oneness, unity with the Trinity in charity. The 
graces afford to us in the sacrament of penance are deliberately given to us to enable us to handle the truth, to handle our unworthiness, to handle our sinfulness, to address our selfishness. And enable us to experience the gift of true sacrificial love through the benefits of his passion upon the cross that we may be forgiven that we may hear the loving words of absolution so that we may be embraced by truth itself and healed by it. This is why, my brothers and sisters, it's so important that we strive to maintain and to hold on to the true apostolic faith as given to the apostles by Christ himself. Of that faith that has endured, endured for 2,000 years, despite all the heresies, despite all the apostasies, despite all the schisms, despite all the manipulations and obfuscation and manipulation of men. That true faith, which still has persisted to this day, and that which as I've always said, we have a ready reckoner for recognising truth from false. The wonderful canon of St Vincent of Lerins. The Catholic faith, i.e. the truth faith, is that which has been believed always, everywhere and by all. So when we hear, when we hear what may be a new whim and fancy or a fable we can easily test it by asking has it always been believed has it always been believed everywhere and has it always been believed by everyone if not then ignore it and similarly ignore those teachers who seek to obfuscate the truth, who seek to teach us a watered down, slightly nicer version of God's law. And there are many around who, through using a language of love, obfuscate the truth about sin, about our own wretchedness and unworthiness. And they will say, I am sure, that they are motivated by love. But the truth is, the truth is, that that is false. The kind of pastors and teachers who tell you that the sin you are committing that has always been everywhere and by all regarded as a sin tell you that it isn't. It may be a, a behaviour, it may be an attitude, it may be a, a way of living that is actually contrary to that which has always been believed everywhere and by all. But whom these false teachers will tell you, oh no, it's okay. No, it's all right. As long as you're not hurting anyone else. As long as you're not hurting yourself. And of course, this hurt, the use of the word hurt, makes us think of something physical. And so we think to ourselves, oh, well, if this sin is not hurting anyone and is not hurting me physically, then, oh, perhaps it's okay then. Or 
or they may say, oh well, as long as it doesn't affect anyone else, as long as it you know, doesn't have a hugely negative impact on, effect on your life, then it's okay. But it's not okay. <coughs> it's sin. It's actually putting up a barrier between ourself and God. It's obfuscating and clouding over the truth. Such teachings allow us to live a lie as well as living lies. Our Lord himself was very clear to warn us about such false prophets and false teachers of false pastors in sheep's clothing, in, of wolves in sheep's clothing. And these false teachers and false prophets, sometimes they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes they even know what they're doing. And as our Lord said, do not fear those who can only kill the body, but rather fear him who can affect the body and the soul. And those who abide and follow these false teachings and false prophets, though physically they may be okay, often they're not. Nonetheless, they are destined not for eternal life in the fullness of the knowledge of God's love. But an eternity that will feel to them empty and lonely and isolated. When our Lord speaks of the least and the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, sometimes I think it's helpful to think of a circle with God, the Blessed Trinity in the middle. Surrounded by the seraphim, and the cherubim, and the angels, the archangels, the dominations, the powers, by the apostles, by the saints, by the martyrs and the confessors, the prophets. Where we are in relation to God in that circle is what our Lord means by the greatest and the least in the kingdom of heaven. And to those who are on the outer edges. It may well feel. Isolated and lonely. On the fringe. If we my brothers and sisters. Want to realise and fully appreciate the wholeness and fullness of God's love, then surely we want to be near the centre, near the centre of God, near the centre of heaven, to be one of the greatest. Why settle for being one of the least? Let us then, my brothers and sisters, apply ourselves, however painful, but as an act of sacrificial love toward God, let us strive to handle the truth. Let us strive to deal with the truth. Let us open ourselves to receive the gifts and graces afforded to us, generously outpoured by God, to enable us to handle and deal with the truth. So that we may indeed be embraced by the truth and become one with the truth. Let us 
to seek, my brothers and sisters, the intercession of those doctors of the truth, like St Bonaventure, and of all those saints who have gone before us, who have strived both to live the truth themselves and to continue the truth and pass it on so that we in our turn have known the truth and now can respond and handle the truth and bring ourselves and others to the fullness of our redemption in him who is God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost.